Base believers, friends of the base, so good to connect with you again. I trust that you're keeping strong. I trust that your faith is growing every day. And I trust that you are staying healthy in this COVID time. I want to ask you to open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. We're talking about growing in God. How do we mature? How do we mature as followers of Jesus? And so we've discovered a couple of fascinating things. But I would love for us today to look at how do we grow with perspective? You see, perspective is a, is a beautiful thing. I wonder how many, how many husbands and wives got lost somewhere in their journey, in their car going somewhere. And normally the husband's perspective is, we don't need to ask anyone, I know where we're going, I know where I'm at. So we just give me a little bit more time and we'll get there. I don't know if those conversations ever comes to mind. Normally the ladies get anxious because it doesn't seem like the husbands know where they're going. And so, so it is with, with this reality that we find today when we grow with perspective. What we find in 1 John chapter 2 is not just that we need input, but there's also a basic test built into these verses that can help us determine where we're at and where we need to go. But for that to happen, we need to know where we're at. We need to know how we're how we finding ourselves or where we're finding ourselves in God how much love is in our lives, how much truth is in our lives. And so for us to discover what that basic test is all about, let's turn to 1 John chapter 2 and let's read together just two verses from verse 12 to 14. It says, I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of His name. I write to you, fathers, because you've known Him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you've known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you've known Him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the Word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Holy Spirit, I ask that as we open our hearts to this Word, that you'll be present with us, that you would locate us, that you would, that you would help us establish where we're at and where we need to grow, where we're at and how we need you for that growth. And I pray as, as we look at these couple of verses, Lord, that that which you desire for us and that which you dream for us, that which, Father, you need to get out of the gospel, that the soberness and the reality of the opportunities we have will be laid in our hearts. I pray that you'll help me to serve your people well. And I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So John is writing this, this letter because he really wants you to know without a shadow of the doubt that you've been born again. And so a couple of phrases that you find that, that he uses is about this light that you now have. It's about this life of God that you now have. And he speaks about the witness of the Spirit that you now have resting on you and confirming in your life that you've been born again. But one of the main evidences that you've been born again, one of the main evidences that you're a believer in Jesus is this reality of growing in love. You see, when you hear truth, it hits your heart, it confronts your heart, and it transforms your heart to the place where you start to believe, and as you start to believe, this process of growth and growing and becoming more like Jesus, loving just like Him, starts to get introduced into your life. And so twice in this book, John actually refers to the fact that in this world, we are like Him. And he, and he refers and likens that image to us learning to love just like Jesus loved when He walked on this earth. So what we find in these two verses is we find the, the different levels of maturity when it comes to love. There's a level of childlike maturity, there's a level of teenage-like maturity, and then there's the, the mature, the adulthood, the mature 
believers that know how to love. And so let's, let's look at verse 12 and 13, speaking about the children and speaking about what you can expect if you're finding yourself at this childlike level. It says about the children that they know that their sins are forgiven and they know that God has become a father to them. And so let's for a moment pause and just let's look at love from the perspective of a child. Now, I don't know how many of you have children. If you have children, I'm sure that you've discovered some things about children. For children, it's all about me. It's all about how does things suit me. I mean, think about that little baby when you, when you had him. You had to get up to feed him every three hours. You had to get up to change him, her nappy. You needed to get up to feed them and look after them. And for the first two years of life, it seems like children are only a blessing because the Bible says so. And when they can start to swim and when they can start to walk, you can start to, to take a bit of a breather. But, but being a child in this process of growing in love, when you're in this level, when you're in this childlike phase, it's all really still all about you. And that's fine, but provided you don't stay there because that's not the fullness of God's plan for your life. So let's look at, let's look at this perspective of love through the eyes of a child. What is this childlike maturity about when you measure it against truth? The truth that a child knows is that God has forgiven me. I know now that I'm a child of God. My sin has been forgiven. Oh, it's so amazing to be free from sin. Can you still remember the day when you gave your life to Jesus and that weight and the load of guilt and shame and the consequence of sin got pushed off your shoulders? Can you remember that moment when, you know, man, I, if I die now, I can't be in a better place. I am right with God. God has forgiven my sin. For some of you, God even healed you right in that moment. You see, healing is not just something God does. Healing is the evidence that God has the ability to forgive your sin. And so when it comes to truth, you can say to others, God has forgiven me. And you can tell them all your stories of when you used to do all those old worldly things. But now you know the truth is God has forgiven me. When it comes to love, as a child, you know that God loves you. And you are so happy to tell everyone, do you know how much my God loves me? God has become our Father, and God loves me. But here's the, here's the difficulty at this stage of maturity when it comes to love. The difficulty is that it's all about you still. It's all about how does truth work for you. It's all about how, how love works for you. And so, and so there's a couple, couple things that we can look at that we discover when you're in this childlike phase, phase, when you're in this childlike phase, you're more concerned about being blessed than what you are concerned about being loving towards others. And so you claim the grace of God, but you use it as an excuse to not grow in love towards others. I'm saved by grace. Oh, God came to help me. And because of that, I can do what I want, how I want. And I don't have to really grow. You know, I can go to heaven based on the grace of God. And you're so right. You're going to make it into heaven because of the kindness of God that came to help you. But what will you look like when you get to heaven? Will you resemble your heavenly Father? Will you resemble the nature and the atmosphere that is true in heaven? That you are living just like everyone in heaven does, full of love. And so at just childlike level, you have the perspective that grace enables you to be free, but sometimes you hide behind grace so that you don't have to grow in love. You know, this, at this level, you claim that God has become your father simply for God to provide so that you can have, but not so that you can give. And so, so much of this childlike level is all about God being your father and God must provide. And, and sometimes you get a bit unsettled if God doesn't provide when you want, how you want, at the time that you want. And all it really describes is just the level of your love, the level of your maturity of where you're finding yourself in. You have got this mindset that God is just all about you and not about others. And I trust that the Lord is busy helping us through these times to grow up, to grow up out of this childlike level of maturity. 
You see, here's the thing about love. Love prefers others long before it prefers itself. That's something you need to learn. That's something that you need to grow in. And as children, we can understand it. But if you're 10 years old in the Lord and you're still a child, there's some things that's wrong. God expects us to grow. He makes all the resources available. And so even my my 14-year-old boy, I'm treating him different now than when he was two years old. But somehow when it comes to faith, we we expect to just stay comfortable as children. And, and, And John is saying, no, come now, guys. It's time for you to grow up in love. And then the next level that John introduces to us is the teenage level. This is a fascinating level. He speaks about in verse 13 and 14 about the young men. Have a look with me. He says about those young men that they overcome the evil one. That they are strong in faith because the word of God lives inside of them. He's describing a teenager in the faith. Now, if I, if I look at the natural, looking at the teenage phase my kids are in, teenage phase is fascinating because they've moved on from just being blessed to the place now where they want to be right. You discovered that in teenage kids? They will argue with you and they will reason with you and they will discuss with you because they are convinced their perspective is the right perspective. Never mind that you have doubled the amount of years they've lived and you've made some mistakes as a parent. Teenage phase is all about being right. Does it witness for any of you adults? I've had these, we're having these fascinating dinner conversations around our table and my kids are taking me on because I'm clearly wrong and they are clearly right. You see, when it comes to this perspective of a teenager, there's a certain way that teenagers look at love and truth. And John is saying, let me help you with that perspective. And if you find yourself there, that's an incredible thing. There's some incredible qualities when it comes to a teenager phase. There's some incredible celebrations, some incredible victories that you can start to, that you can start to appreciate. And so when it comes to truth, young men, these teenagers, they know that God now lives inside of them. I love how John says the word lives inside of him. It's not just the Bible. It's not just the pages of this book. It is those pages, but it's also the realization, man, I've got God inside of me. I'm dangerous now. I can actually step out and I can cause some damage to the enemy. At this teenage stage, you start to get a revelation of the demonic. You start to get a revelation that you've got authority to stand against disease, to stand against demons, to to even stand against death. And so when it comes to truth, At the teenage level, they become quite dangerous. They know that God lives inside of them. They know that the nature of God, the life of God, is now inside of them. And this new creation inside of them is wanting to confront everything of the old creation. What a wonderful, radical truth. I love how the Bible describes the word strong. It says that the young men are strong. They're energetic. They've got energy. They want to go out and just anything that moves, they want to drive out and they want to deliver and get healed. And that's when you're at the young men phase, the teenage level of your faith. When it comes to love, the young men and women, the teenagers, is still in essence all about God loving me. I'm going to show you how right I am. I'm not necessarily going to show you how loving I am. And so if you're at this teenage level of your faith, of your development in love, then it's more important for you to be right than what it is for you to be loving. And I find so many believers stuck in this phase. I'm talking teenagers now. I'm talking men and women. They've walked with the Lord. Some of them are actually gray-haired already. And I find myself sometimes surprised of who is stuck in the teenager level. They want to be right, but they don't know how to be loving. And there's nothing wrong with truth. We need truth. Truth will liberate us. But it's how we present truth that is so important. And so these teenagers, they care enough to correct. For them, loving is all about correcting you. Sorting out your behavior because clearly you're wrong. And we need to get that demon off your shoulder because then you'll really live free. I don't know if it sounds familiar. I don't know if you can associate with where you're at. Maybe there's more of us stuck at this level than we would like to see. What's beautiful about 
these teenagers, what's beautiful about the teenage faith level, this teenage love level, is that you claim faith, but you don't have sincere faith. You see, faith is so needed. Faith is, is how I take up my position in heavenly places. Faith is how I take up my place of authority in heaven. Is how I access the peace that is mine in heaven. But Paul says all that, real sincere faith is lived out in this way, that you can see it through love. And so the teenagers amongst us, they claim faith, and you can see they've got faith. But that faith is not sincere yet, because sincere faith is faith seen in love. These teenagers claim victory, but they're not consistent in love. See, how do you know that you're really free? How do you live in freedom? It's only through love. But when you're a teenager in the faith, you claim the victory, you stand on the truth, and you know it's true, and you give yourself for the truth. But your love is very inconsistent. You claim the victory, but you're not consistent with your love. You see, here's the reality about love. Love displays truth long before it disperses truth. Love displays truth long before it disperses truth. Think about your marriage. Think about your marriage when, when you want to correct your spouse. You just want to disperse the truth but you haven't displayed the truth that you love them. And so how the world needs us, friends, how the world needs us to display truth, not just disperse truth. And so often in the history of the church, we were able to disperse truth and disperse truth, but our actions didn't display the reality that we love and that we are being loved. And so then we get to this last perspective, this last level of the test, and as I look at how this is put together, I'm praying that at the base, and even for the friends of the base, that there will be many at this level. Experience have taught me there's very few there, but I'm trusting that even in these times, God will use our times of being with Him and our times of being isolated and locked into our homes. I'm trusting that the Lord is busy using these times to get more fathers and mothers, mature men and women of the faith. In verse 13 and 14, he describes the fathers. Now, now, while there's a lot said about the children at that perspective level, and a lot said about the teenagers in the perspective of how they see love, listen to how the fathers and the mothers of the faith are described in both instances. It says, I write to you fathers because you've known him is from the beginning. I write to you fathers because you've known him who is from the beginning. That is priceless. When you get to, to the maturity perspective in love, this is not about you getting blessed. It's not about you being right. It's all about you being in fellowship with God. It's all about you getting to know the secrets of God, the ways of God, the friendship with God, in which God says, I'm going to tell my friend these secrets. I'm going to share my secrets of my ways and my thinking. I'm going to share that with him. So when it comes to this fatherhood maturity level, this father-like maturity level, your love is all about others. You see, when it comes to truths, Fathers not only have heard the truth, they've applied this truth. And, and the truth that they write with God has been assimilated to the place where they now know God. Not God that knows them. They know God. And their love, their love is at the place where, where they want to show God. I want to show you what God is like. I want to demonstrate how loving God is, how kind God is. You see, for fathers, it is far more important to be available because availability is what it looks like to be loving. To be available, to just say, come, my, my child, we're going to change this nappy now, and then we're going to throw the nappies away. My boy, that truth is powerfully right, but let me help you with a real understanding of the principle because you've got the principle a little bit bent. You've got some opinions, but we need to get some truth. And so fathers are all about those being available. For fathers to be there is to care. 
And so when it comes to, to fathers, fathers care enough to count. They want to count in other people's lives. They want to count in other people's journeys. They want to teach you out of their mistakes and say, don't go there. You can save yourself 10 years of heartache. Don't go there. Just take this route. Look at what the Bible says. Look at what the Scripture says. Fathers care enough to count. You see, love needs to be received before it can be released. And fathers know this. Fathers know that for them to be loving, they need to be in a place of fellowship with God where they can receive the love, not just for themselves, but so that they can release the love of God. You see, for fathers, it's all about influence. For fathers, it's not about affluence. For fathers, it's about influence. Affluence describes about the recognition of men. It describes the riches of the world. Father says, you know what? I can leave affluence aside. I just, I'm choosing influence. I want to influence your life. I don't want to control your life. I want to influence you and help you that you can grow in the quickest amount of time to love just like Jesus loved us. So I want to, I want to pray with you today. I don't know where you've located yourself. I don't know whether you're at a childlike level I don't know if you were at a teenager-like level, and I don't know if you were at a father-like level, but here's what I do know. I know that God has given us His Holy Spirit to not just help us stay where we're at, but to grow into the fullness. And I would love for us to pray together. Father, I thank You for this basic test that we can discover where we're at with You. And I pray, Lord, that what we're finding as we look at our hearts, as we, dis, as we inspect our lives, I pray that what we find there will give us a great courage and a great conviction to call on your name, to ask you for help. Father, when we, when we go to heaven one day, we, we want to know what your love did for us, but also what your love did through us. And I ask you that for every believer at the base, for every friend of the base that's listening to this message, I ask that you will help us to grow in love. I pray and ask Holy Spirit, help us with revelation of truth and help us to take up that revelation so that it will transform us to love. Holy Spirit, thank you that your love is busy driving out fear. I've got such a sense that even some of you that's sitting here have got a, a warped idea of who, of who God as a father is. You're thinking that he's waiting to punish you. He's waiting to rebuke you. He's waiting to discipline you. And while God might use discipline from time to time, he only uses discipline because he loves us. And so, Father, I pray even for minds, mindsets to shift in this moment. I ask for the furiosity of your love, for the furious love of God to come and rest on us. And Father, I declare over every believer, I declare Father-like love, Father-like faith. I thank you that in this season we will see many fathers, many mothers, mature believers, mature followers of Jesus arise and stand up. We bless you and we honor you, Lord. Amen. My friends, maybe you've realized that you're actually not born again yet. If you're listening to me, you're realizing, she's there's a childlike faith. There's a teenager-like faith. There's a father-like faith. I don't have any of that. Well, then I want to encourage you. That's the reason why this letter was written, for you to discover, do you have the real deal? Do you have the faith that will transform your life? And if you discover that you haven't, I want to ask you very simply. You raise your hands and you start to call on the name of Jesus, and you ask Him to save you. He is so faithful. He's waiting for you to recognize that you need Him. Call on the name of Jesus and just say, Jesus, would you come and save me? I'm calling on your name. Would you save me? Would you transform my life? If you can change my life, have it. I want to I I challenge you to ask him that question. If he can change your life, let Jesus have it and see how he will transform you. Bless you, friends. So good to connect with you. Looking forward to catching up soon.